Mr. Speaker, this past Sunday marked the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, a tremendous milestone for one of the most significant civil rights laws of the 20th century. As a member of Congress, as co-chair of the Bipartisan Disabilities Caucus, and someone who has lived with the challenges of a disability both before and after the ADA's enactment in 1990, I've experienced firsthand the profound changes that this law has affected within our society. When I was paralyzed at the age of 16, my life changed forever. As I lay in my hospital bed, I wondered what life could possibly have in store for me next. But I drew strength and inspiration from other people with disabilities who had accomplished both great things and small. They taught me that there was life after a disability. I was also incredibly fortunate to have the support of my family and my community whose generosity and concern ultimately what made me want to give back to Rhode Island through a career in public service. But accessibility was not yet considered a civil right at that time, and I know many people with disabilities were not as fortunate as I was. So many passionate advocates and champions like Mr. Hoyer fought for the rights and protections enshrined in this law. For all of us, the ADA has been a profoundly life-altering act that has provided new opportunities and fundamentally changed the way society views and treats people with disabilities. The ADA has broken down physical and psychological barriers. It has opened up opportunities to education, employment, and technology. It has made public transportation more accommodating, improved voting accessibility, and expanded inclusion and justice for millions. At its core, this groundbreaking legislation codified the collective ideal that no one should suffer discrimination because of a disability. Mr. Speaker, it was that with the same conviction that I was pleased to support the passage of the ADA Amendments Act in 2008 after a number of court decisions diluted the definition of what constituted a disability. When that law was signed into effect, I had the privilege of being with Mr. Hoyer and several of the other champions of the Americans with Disabilities Act, original enactment, uh, original, original authors of the ADA, including Senator Harkin and uh, Cheryl Sensenbrenner. I also had the privilege of, of meeting President George H.W. Bush uh, and be with uh, his son, President George W. Bush, as President w, George W. Bush signed that, uh, that, uh, that bill into law. It was such an honor for me to be able to personally thank President George H.W. Bush personally for his support and leadership in seeing the original ADA signed into law. Now, the, when the ADA Amendments Act was passed, these rulings uh, effectively, the, the court rulings that, uh, that took place necessitating this act, effectively limited the ADA's coverage and excluded people with disabling conditions that were not readily visible or apparent like uh, epilepsy, MS, and various developmental disabilities. So the ADA Amendments Act reaffirmed the protections of the ADA and upheld the ideals of equality and opportunity on which this country was founded. As a result of these efforts, I'm proud that future generations will live in a world that is more inclusive, more accessible, and increasingly recognizes the unique talents and abilities of individuals with disabilities. As we celebrate our accomplishments, so must we recognize that our work is not finished. Equal employment opportunities and fully integrated community living have not yet been entirely realized. In fact, recent data shows that 31 percent of disabled individuals live below the poverty line and less than 34 percent are fully employed. Mr. Speaker, as a nation, we can do better and we must. It's more important than ever that we educate businesses and connect them with proper resources to create more employment opportunities. Many people with disabilities have both the desire and the capability to work, as well as exceptional talents to offer. 
Mr. Speaker, let us not see those talents go to waste. I've often said, Mr. Speaker, that people with disabilities are still one of this, greatest, this nation's greatest untapped resources, and we need to tap into that talent to see our nation grow even further. Mr. Speaker, the divergent backgrounds, unique experiences, and wide-ranging talents promote a culture of diversity that doesn't just play a role in the workplace, but also influences the very nature of our society. With proper awareness, accommodation, and investment, our economy and society can reap countless rewards. We must also ensure that transportation is available and accessible to everyone so that they can get to their job, the doctor, or the grocery store. I've often said that it doesn't do anyone any good if they can actually apply for a job and get the job but can't get to the job. So that needs to improve. Now, to help us realize this goal, I've introduced the Transit Accessibility Innovation Act, legislation that would create a competitive grant program to encourage transit systems to make public transportation more accessible and user-friendly. Mr. Speaker, accessible public transportation is essential in order for people with disabilities to live independently with full inclusion in their communities. By improving these services, we can improve the quality of life for countless individuals and families. Yeah. And Mr. Speaker, to further promote independence, we must also ensure that family caregivers of people with disabilities have greater access to critical services like respite care. Respite care provides temporary relief for family members engaged in the full-time task of caring for their aging or disabled loved ones with special needs. Now, Mr. Speaker, these caregivers, I've often said, are unsung heroes. These caregivers devote so much of their time, energy, and love to their, to their families. But in many cases, they can be often unprepared for these new responsibilities and challenges that they, that they face can be daunting, from employment difficulties to financial challenges to depression and, and family stress. Very often, though, with just a little bit of assistance, they can continue to be extraordinary caregivers and to fulfill all the other challenges and uh, responsibilities that, uh, that a family requires. So that's why I've introduced and I've, I've championed the Lifespan Respite Care Act, Mr. Speaker, with my friend and former Republican colleague, Mike Ferguson from New Jersey. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that law, uh, it, it passed into law in, in 2006 and has already provided grants to 32 states and the District of Columbia to help set up respite care networks for families in need. Mr. Speaker, I continue to push for this program's reauthorization, and I included it in the Military and Veteran Caregiver Services Improvement Act that, uh, that I uh, introduced in April to strengthen the, the, the support services that family caregivers uh, of injured uh, of, and disabled veterans. I think this is an, an important thing that we can do for our veterans. So we've come far, Mr. Speaker, since the passage of the ADA, but we still have much more work ahead. Disabilities don't discriminate on the basis of, a, of party affiliation, income level, or gender. Instead, they can happen to anyone at any time. So I believe, Mr. Speaker, that they also have the unique ability to unite us in common purpose. So as we celebrate the silver anniversary of the ADA together, we must use this as a call to action and to reaffirm our commitment to equal opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency for people with disabilities everywhere. Let me close, Mr. Speaker, by thanking the many champions and advocates and many unsung heroes who made the ADA possible and saw it through the legislative process and put it on the desk of President George H.W. Bush who signed it into law and changed the lives of people with disabilities everywhere, forever. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time.